I'm Jared, and if you were there for our first outdoor gathering this past month, you already know that it was awesome. And if you didn't make it, the good news is that you have another shot next Sunday, October 11th. That's right, we're having our second in-person outdoor gathering Sunday, October 11th at 4 p.m., and this time we will be on our land. We have a lot of great things planned for all of you, and we hope you'll mark your calendars for it and take a second to register. If you haven't already, just text OUTDOOR, all one word, to 94090 and we will get you set up. Now, if it's your first time joining us online, you picked a great week to tune in. Lead Pastor Matt Johnson has been working his way through his Talking Points series, and today he is on part three. If you find yourself watching and wishing you could watch the first two weeks from the series, <laughs> well, you're in luck. You can always catch up on current and previous talks in any of our platforms. We've got our website, journeycalloway.com. We're on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, iTunes. You name it, we've got it, and all you have to do is search Journey Calloway. We'd love to say we're glad you're here today to all our first-time viewers by sending you a free gift card. Just text I am here to 94090 and we'll send it your way. After Matt's message today, Paul will be sharing a song that is a journey favorite, so be sure to stick around for that. And as always, we have questions for you to process with your family and friends. All right, enough jibber jawing from me. Here's Matt with part three of Talking Points. On July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was approved by the Second Continental Congress, and this experiment that we call American freedom was born, and aren't we glad that it happened? The early authors, Thomas Jefferson and the other men who penned the Declaration of Independence, well, they understood that that freedom that we all celebrate and enjoy today it came with a purpose, and in the very early lines of the Declaration, you'll remember this from your high school history class, they stated what they saw to be the purpose of our freedom. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, to them, they said, it, it seems obvious that everyone should believe this, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And then they define what some of those rights are, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, some of them admitted this, and we all know this to be true looking back. There was a bit of hypocrisy in putting this in the Declaration of Independence because while they said all men are created equal, there's a self-evident truth that's obvious to us all. They didn't actually live it out. They didn't abolish slavery. Women weren't always treated on equal footing with men. But what this did do is this truth, this belief that all men are created equal, it was like a seed that was planted in the soil of American freedom, and it's never died. And we're still fighting for that truth today, aren't we? But these 56 signers of the Declaration and honestly, all the men and women there in 1776, they understood that the purpose of freedom wasn't all that they had to grasp or embrace, that there was a price to it as well, which is why near the end of the document, these 56 signers who eventually signed it committed something to each other. Here's what they said. They said, we mutually pledged each other in signing this, our lives, our fortunes, and 
our sacred honor. You see, the people of 1776, they understood that freedom has both a purpose and a price. The purpose of American freedom, well, that's individual rights, but the price, it's personal responsibility. And whenever a society, whenever a community, in this case, whenever our country reaches a point where we fight and grasp and hold on to individual rights, but let go of our personal responsibility, when we prioritize our individual rights over our personal responsibility, well, that is the moment that the foundation of our freedom begins to crumble. That is, you might say, the end of the world as we know it. But more on that in just a minute. This is episode three of Talking Points, the perfect blend of politics, race, and religion. And if you're new with us in this series, this is not about a political agenda. We're not trying to push any political agenda on you because Jesus, well, he didn't come to introduce any political agenda. He didn't come to endorse any political point of view. Jesus came to introduce something brand new. And yet those of us who follow him, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can just lean in here and pay attention for a minute. But for those of us who follow him, well, this lands close to home. And it lands close to home because we have a tendency to put our hope in politicians, to put our hope in a political process or political party. We have a tendency to put our hope in things that aren't going to deliver and shift our hope away from the one that we say we follow. And so the question that I've been asking all of us who wear the label Christian is simply this. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of our faith instead of creating a version of faith, instead of creating a version of Jesus that supports your politics? Because we all have a tendency to do this, don't we? To think, well, Jesus would believe and look at politics just like me. If you're a Democrat and you're a Christian, you have a tendency to think, well, if Jesus were here, he'd obviously be a Democrat. If you're a Republican and a Christian, you think, well, clearly he would be a Republican. To you, it sometimes seems self-evident, doesn't it? But as I said, Jesus didn't come to endorse any political point of view. Jesus came to introduce a brand new worldview. Or well, the way we've been saying it is, Jesus is a king who came to reverse the order of things. And so when you follow Jesus, what it requires of you to do, if you're literally following him, is to stand in the middle or to stand above where both political parties are. And when you have to choose between the lesser of two evils, you actually call out both evils. When you have to choose between two imperfect politicians, two imperfect parties, two imperfect political platforms, well, you just point out the imperfections in both. You don't believe and you don't blindly follow one as being perfectly good, perfectly true, perfectly aligned with the values of Jesus because he is the king who came to reverse the order of things. His values that he introduced in this world as he taught us about the kingdom of God, well, they changed the way we looked at everything, which is why we should not first and foremost be party people. We should first and foremost be kingdom people. He reversed the order of things, including the way we should look at freedom. Now, all of us love our American freedom. And if you have spent much time outside of this country and other parts of the world, I don't care where you've gone. I don't care what country you've been in. You appreciate deeply the freedom that we have here in America. For me personally, I don't know if there's a better place in the world to live. I'm so grateful for the freedom that we have. However, you need to understand and I need to understand that American freedom, well, that is freedom from, and you know what it's from. It's freedom from tyranny. It's freedom from terror. It's freedom from taxation without representation. It's freedom from oppression. It's freedom from unnecessary restrictions and limitations. It's a freedom from, but... That freedom from is centered on protecting me and my rights. This is the whole point of American freedom, isn't it? Which is why you hear people say all the time, well, I'm protecting my rights. I'm not letting you take away my rights. Oh no, they're not going to tell me what to do. I'm not just going to be another sheep following. I've got rights. Don't tread on me. I'm protecting me and my rights because we deeply believe, and rightly so, that American freedom is freedom from anyone trampling on our rights. It's designed to protect all of the rights that we have. However, and this is where you may have never thought of this before. When Jesus showed up, he reversed the order of things. He reversed the way we think about freedom. As much as those of us who are Christians value our American freedom, there is a higher form of freedom to which we should follow, embrace, and live. There's a higher form of freedom that Jesus introduced into this world. 
not to dispatch or dispel American freedom, but to elevate it to an entirely new level. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the churches in the region of Galatia, he unpacked this idea of Christian freedom a little bit. I want to read you just a little bit of what he had to say. And then I want you to be able to take this and pair it with our American freedom to evaluate how well you and I are actually living and embracing the freedom that we get to experience. To those of us who are followers of Jesus, here's what he said to us. In Galatians chapter 5, he said, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. To which we all go, well, yeah, that's, that's what we love. We love the fact that we're free. We can do whatever we want to do. For those of us who are Christians, we're going, well, yeah, that's the whole point. I want to be free. Now, let me just say this real quick. If you think following Jesus, or if your experience following Jesus has not led you to experience greater freedom, then you are doing it wrong. Because the whole point of Jesus' coming was actually to make you free. Not just to give you freedom from tyranny or terror or taxation without representation. No, no, no. Something much deeper. Jesus came to free you from the tyranny of what's going on inside of you and inside of me. The tyranny of our sin nature. Jesus came to free us so we could be who God created us to be. So we could be free from the sin that controls us. So I don't know if any sin's controlling me. Well, you and I both had the experience where we've gone, I just can't do the things that I say I want to do, and the things that I say I don't want to do, well, I keep doing it. Well, there's your sin nature right there. And Jesus came to free us from the control that that sin has on our lives, which is why some Christians, maybe you've heard this, this is why some Christians go, oh, wait a minute, let me see if I understand this. I'm forgiven? Right, God's forgiven me for all of those things that I've done that I regret, all those things that have hurt other people? He's forgiven me of all my sins? Well, great. Now I can just live any way I want to live because I've got forgiveness. And Paul goes, no, no, you have completely misunderstood it. You, as a follower of Jesus, if you wear the label Christian, you have been called to be free. But Paul says that, do, that you should not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. In other words, Paul's going, you shouldn't use the freedom that you've experienced and received from God for your own benefit. You shouldn't use it just so you can do whatever you want to do. And this is where all of us begin to resist a little bit because this is where it feels like what Paul's talking about is clashing with our American freedom. I mean, the whole point of me being free is so I'm independent. Isn't this a dream all of us have? I just want to be independent. I want to be able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't want to have to go to work. If I, if I don't feel like it, I want to be able to stay home. I want to be free financially so I can do whatever I want. I want to be free so I can go where I want. People can't tell me what to do. I want to be free so I just don't have to follow people around and you know, follow orders. No, no. I want to be independent. This is what we value so much. And it feels like what Paul is saying is clashing with that. But it's not. It's actually elevating it. But his point is, you have been called to freedom, but not a freedom that makes you more self-centered. Not a freedom that turns your focus back on you. If you wear the label Christian, no, you, you've experienced a higher level of freedom. It's a freedom designed to do this. He says, rather, you should serve one another humbly in love. In other words, Jesus didn't die on a cross and rise again to pay the penalty for your sins just so you could go on living any way you wanted to live. Just so you would miss hell and experience heaven and be blessed in this life and have all your prayers answered. No, no, no. The whole reason that Jesus came to set you free is so you could serve the people around you, so you could love the people around you, so you could be the kind of person that God created you to be. Not a self-centered individual, but a selfless one. This is why he says your freedom, if you're a Christian, your freedom is designed to free you from yourself. Your freedom is designed to free you from your tendency and your sin nature to turn everything inward and focus on you. Your freedom is designed to help you serve one another humbly in love. He goes on. He says this next. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Now, when he talks about the law, he's talking about basically the Old Testament, all the Old Testament. He says, you can sum it all up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole reason Jesus has set us free, so we can love our neighbor as ourselves. So, we don't live in the tyranny, in the prison, if you will, of self-centeredness, where everything revolves around us. 
Because if you live that way, if I live that way, if we live as if everything is about us, we will get to the end of our lives and we will have nothing to show for ourselves but ourselves. There won't be anything of value left. No real freedom. The freedom Jesus came to give us is actually a freedom to turn our focus away from us, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let me see if I can explain it this way. American freedom is freedom from the centered on protecting me and my rights. But Christian freedom, well, that's freedom for the centered on serving you and your needs. They do not contradict. We all value, we all want our individual rights. But Jesus came along and he said, you hold your individual rights in one hand, but you hold your personal responsibility in the other. And your personal responsibility, if you are a follower of Jesus, is to take the freedom you have and not use it just to defend and protect your rights, but to take the freedom you have and to use it to serve and meet the needs of those around you. American freedom, well, that's a basic form of freedom everybody should have. Christian freedom, well, what Jesus did is he elevated freedom and said, now, you can take the freedom you have because you have rights and you can use them for the benefit of someone else. You can take the freedom you have because you have rights, but you can make it not about you. You can make it about the people all around you. Now, before you push back and resist on that idea, let me just remind you, if you're a Christian, this is exactly what our Savior did for us, isn't it? Jesus showed up on this earth and of all people who have ever lived, he was most entitled to his rights. He was the one who was most entitled to say, here I am, God in human flesh, and here's what I deserve, and here are my rights, and you're going to serve me, and you're going to follow me. And He didn't do any of that, though. He took his rights. He took his power. He took his freedom. And he said, how can I use this for the benefit of the people around me? You and I have benefited because Jesus chose to take his freedom and make it not just a freedom from, he chose to take his freedom and make it a freedom for serving you and serving me. He said, I have rights, but I also have a responsibility. And when necessary, I will willingly choose, not forced to, I will willingly choose to lay down my rights so that I can serve you. As Christians, this is the higher form of freedom we have been called to. And when we fail to do that, when we choose to hold on to our individual rights, well, we've got a right to this and we've got a right to that and nobody can tell us. When we choose to hold on to our individual rights and let go of our personal responsibility, well, that is the moment when things begin to crumble. Paul saw this coming as he's writing to the churches in Galatia. Here's what he says to him next. He says, but if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. In other words, if you get to the point where you just fight for your individual rights, I'm going to fight for what's mine. I'm going to fight for what I deserve. Nobody can tell me. And you hold so tightly to your individual rights and you release or relinquish or abandon or ignore your personal responsibility to serve other people, to put that person before yourself. He said, the minute you do that, well, you're going to destroy each other. Now, it's almost like Paul could see into the future, couldn't he? Because is this not what we are seeing happen in churches and among Christians all over our country? Is this not what we're seeing play out time and time and time again? Christians who are saying, well, I have a right to this, and I have a right to this, and I have a right to this. And they choose their rights at the expense of somebody else. That is not the higher form of Christian freedom that Jesus modeled, demonstrated, taught, and called us to. Now, if you find yourself pushing back on this idea of relinquishing your rights voluntarily for the benefit of somebody else, let me just remind you that you do this from time to time. Matter of fact, you probably do this in some way every single day because you know it's what's best for you and the people around you. I'll give you a couple examples. My wife and I, even though we're married, we both have the right to commit adultery. I mean, we're not going to get thrown in jail for it. It's not breaking the law. We have a right to do that, but we don't do that. And you know why? It'd be silly to do that because 
We have a personal responsibility to one another to put the other person before ourselves. That's what great marriages do. And so while we have a right to engage in this action, we choose to lay down our right and elevate our responsibility over our rights because it's best for the other person. Quite honestly, it's best for us as well. If you have ever been in a situation or had friends or family members who were in the situation where a divorce happened and two exes are now co-parenting their kids, well, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of this, haven't you? In the best of those situations, two people who used to be married to one another go, you know what? We are going to always choose what's best for the kids above ourselves. In other words, we each have rights. We can go to court and we can fight and, you know, I get this much time and I get them on this day. We can fight for all of that and we can try to protect our rights at all costs. But the best exes, the best parents, they say we are going to lay down some of our rights and we are instead going to elevate our personal responsibility to do what's in the best interest of those kids. So I know the court says this, but I'm going to let you go ahead and have them. I know the court says this. But we'll do it this way. I'll agree to this because it's what's best for them. In the ugliest and the worst of cases, those individuals, they hold on to their rights. They lay down their personal responsibility. And everyone suffers as a result. Well, what's true in those situations is true in all of life for you and for me. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, if you're not, you, you can figure out how much personal responsibility you want to elevate above your rights. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, well, I don't think we have much of a call here, do we? I mean, if if you and I find ourselves resisting, going, well, I have a right to do this, so I'm not going to do what's in their best interest because I'm going to protect my rights. Well, it's kind of a hard argument to make with our Savior, isn't it? Can you imagine Jesus standing here and you trying to explain why you're going to do what's best for you over what's best for the other person? Could you make that argument to him while you were looking at the nail scars in his wrist and his feet as he chose what was best for you over what was best for him? As he elevated personal responsibility over his own rights as God? I don't know that any of us would have enough audacity or arrogance to make that argument. So here's the question I want to ask you. Where? Are you elevating your individual rights over your personal responsibility? Where have you chosen to embrace American freedom, which is good, nothing wrong with that, but ignored your Christian freedom? So you've focused on your freedom from, but you have neglected the freedom God has given you to be for the people around you. Whenever your freedom, whenever your rights are detrimental to the people around you, then as a Christian, you have lost sight of your greater calling and your greater purpose. You have lost sight of the fact that freedom has both a purpose and it has a price. It requires some self-sacrifice. So let me give you a couple questions to think about. Hopefully you'll discuss these with whoever you're with right now watching or with your small group or with some family or friends at some point this week. First question is this, what are some examples of how Americans are creating damage by using their freedom selfishly? Now listen, if you start discussing this with people, remember everybody has different points of view, so be respectful. But it'd be interesting to hear how different people view this, how we're taking our American freedom and we're using it to the detriment of some people around us. Second question, is there a decision you recently justified on the basis of American freedom? Well, I'm free to do what's best for me. So I'm not doing that. I'm not following that. I'm not listening to that because I've got rights. Is there a decision you recently justified on the basis of your American freedom instead of Christian freedom? In other words, you violated your Christian freedom in the process of it. The Christian freedom that says I'm free to do what's best for the people around me. Listen, for you and for me, if we're Christians, what we should be known for is not, well, there are people who protect their rights. I'm not saying you don't have to do that at times. But I'm saying we shouldn't be known as people who are always fighting for our own rights. We should be people who are known for our personal responsibility. People who hold rights in one hand and responsibility in the other, and they say, you know what? Nobody's forcing me to do this. 
But if I need to lay down my rights in order to serve you, I'm going to do it. If I need to lose so that you can win, well, I'm going to lose in this instance. I'm telling you, if we will become people who do that, it will get the attention of our communities. And they will lean in and want to learn more about the Savior who really has set us free. Jesus, well, he chose to lay down his rights and lose so that you and I could win. And maybe it's time we as a church figure out how to follow his example. And we'll pick it up right there in episode four of Talking Points. Now, the reason that we can do that, the reason that you should feel okay going, I've got these rights, but I'm going to voluntarily not exercise them right now because it's going to damage or hurt that individual. The reason you should feel free to elevate Christian freedom, personal responsibility above American freedom and your individual rights. Well, what allows us to do that is the fact that we know we have a God who is for us. We have a God who is with us. And we have a God who set the example to us. We have a God who has given all of himself, his whole heart to us. And when you have God on your side, well, what really do you have to fear? Captive by an enemy He had Thinking I was out of reach. Oh Jesus Mercy shut its mouth I was once Crippled by the weight of shame In there I couldn't even show my face Oh, Jesus, then I heard you speak. And your love, it comes with no conditions. You give us your whole heart. My hope is in the blood of Jesus. I know who I am. Go. 
give us your whole heart. My hope is in the blood of Jesus. I know who I am because of who you are. I know who I am because of who you are. I know who I am because of